So we're there. So we've now got Dave who's going to talk to us about Android things. Um, I know absolutely nothing about Android things, being an Apple shill, so I'm really excited to learn more. Take away, Dave. Cool, thank you. Okay, can you hear me in the back? Sweet, awesome. So they say that um, planning is the enemy of adventure. So welcome to my adventurous talk on Android things. So my name's Dave, I'm a developer, Android developer, and I'm going to talk to you about Android things today. I'll give you a brief overview of the platform, what you can do to it, um, what features you can use, and how you can probably integrate it into a, uh, a home automation system. So Android Things isn't really a home automation system, but you can use it to create components for home automation. Um, just to kind of get an idea, hands up if you're a developer, or if you've got software in your title. <coughs> hands up if you do something else. Do such a thing? Got like some agile coaches, marketing people. Anyone, anyone play with an Arduino? What about Raspberry Pi? Anyone let the smoke out of electronics? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so Android Things. So Android Things is a platform developed by Google. It sits alongside the Android Android Mobile. Android Wear, Android TV, and uh, Android Auto. Um, it's really for developing embedded systems or IoT devices. Um, so it gives you the advantage of a stable platform certified by Google. It gives you a broad um, range of, of features. It gives you a good history of people who have been using Android to develop mobile apps for a long time. We've written some great libraries. You can use all of those things in your Android Things project. Um, it also gives you a path to mass production. So if you made a device with an Arduino or a, a Raspberry Pi, that was great, everything was going perfectly, and then you wanted to turn that into a product that you had to sell, there's really no clear pathway that you can go down. But with Android Things, you've got the backing of Google and some clear pathways that you can go down to um, to get your device on the market. So it's ideal for intelligent devices. So you wouldn't want to use one of these in every light switch, or in every sensor, or in every um, every every um, thing that tells you one single item. But you can use it for um, image recognition, anything that you need some kind of uh, power or some kind of processing power. So you, the idea is that you, um, you can have your cameras, gateways, HVAC, um, smart meters, um, point of sale systems, inventory control, um, vending machines. Uh, where you guys are probably interested most is you can use it for security systems and smart doorbells. Um, you can have some intelligence in the device and you can also get like sensor reading. So you can connect sensors directly, you can connect sensors, you can connect um, outputs and you can connect awesome things like cameras um, and you can leverage the power of the Android platform. So it's based mostly on the Android SDK, there are a few things missing um, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now you can use your favourite IDE which is Android Studio um, <laughs> based on IntelliJ. Okay, awesome. And one key feature, if you've ever developed a embedded system before, is that you have access to Google Play services. So you have access to maps, and you have access to location, and you have access to cool things that you might need, um, but you don't want to write yourself. And then you can also use Google or anyone else's backend. So you can use Firebase, you can use Cloud IoT Core, you can use any of the uh, web services that you know and love. Um, you can use SDK, you can use the Android NDK. And you can scale it to production. So they introduced this thing called the SOM architecture. So a system or module is this little square in the corner. So that contains your processor, uh, your memory, contains some power control, and it also has your uh, Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi and Bluetooth come on a module that's pre-certified. So that saves you a lot of money if you want to create something in production. So they put. This is the, uh, the dev kit based on an uh, NXP 
Ibex 7D processor, um, and it's kind of Raspberry Pi compatible. So the pinout is Raspberry Pi compatible. You can also run Android things on a Raspberry Pi 3B or 3 Plus um, and get you up and running. So these are developer platforms, so you can ship up to sort of 100 devices, but just for internal testing. Uh, so you could create your own home hub, you could create your uh, MQTT client, or you could do um, anything that you would normally use a Raspberry Pi for. Um, and use up to 100 of them um, before you had to sign an agreement with, with Google if you wanted to, to ship your product. Um, so this really simplifies the amount of work you have to do if you want to make a product. It's really hard to make these things. There's kind of a black art to do it. You need like a really good hardware guy, a really good firmware guy or girl, um, and a lot of work and a lot of certification. Um, the thing about this is that Google manages the board support package. So although they do a lot of work for you, it also means that some of the stuff's uh, locked down. You can't create your own um, kernel drivers and things like that. So their physical song is something you can plug into your baseboard that you create. Um, you can ship with that. You can ship, and that will scale you know, up to tens of thousands of units. At some point, that's going to be cost prohibitive if you wanted to make millions of them. So if your product was really great and awesomely successful, they also have a, a virtual sum, which is basically the schematic and the PCB layout that you just copy and paste into your um, PCB layout software. Um, and then you can put it all on your own board. So the thing that, well, some of the advantages of uh, Android things is that it uses signed images. So the signed images are verified by Google. So one thing about IoT and home automation that you've probably all heard is that a developer creates a device or a company creates a device, they ship with the default passwords, they ship with ports open, and there's some terrible hack and uh, everyone hears about it and a uh, few people get fired and that's the end of that. Um, so having this back by Google means that they have put a lot of effort into um, verifying the security. So they have the signed images, a verified boot, so they have an AB boot system, so they verify the boot image if it doesn't, if they get a, a new image through an over-the-air upgrade and it's not signed, it falls back to the uh, original sim uh, image that was on the device, and then they provide automatic security updates. So they maintain an over-the-air update system, um, so you would publish your, your app, and you create your app, which runs on your Android Things device, it's the only app that's on the device, you bundle it with uh, the firmware, and then um, Google signs that, and then they ship it out to your device. Sorry Dave, so is this a bit different to the Android phone ecosystem in that Google's pushing the updates themselves direct? Yes. Okay. So with the phone ecosystem, your, your handset manufacturer will create the board support package, so they'll create the version of Android that's on that device, they have to get that certified by Google in order to call it an Android device, and then they have to maintain their own over-the-air update system um, to push out updates to the devices. Now with this, a lot of that's been handled by Google. Cool. So Google handles the Linux kernel, they handle the hardware drivers, the libraries, and the Android framework. They also handle the over the updates. So if you're familiar with Android um, app development, you have the Play Store, which you log on to as a developer, and you publish your APK, and it's available to everybody um, who has a compatible handset. So with the Google, um, Sorry, the Android Developer Console. It's a similar idea. You have a, a, a web app that you log into, you upload your APK, but it only goes out to your device. So Google are guaranteeing uh, long term support of three years per device, which is, in my opinion, that's a little bit short. Most I've worked on embedded systems devices for a long time. And you typically want at least like a five year life, life cycle or a five year support window where your manufacturer is going to support the device for at least five years. So Google have said they'll support it for at least three years. Um, 
important at least, so there is some hope there that they'll support it for a bit longer. But they'll provide security patches and fixtures, fixes for a minimum of three years, and they will also continue to provide those updates if a manufacturer abandons a device. So, a little bit of code. Is anyone afraid of Kotlin? No, it's great. Yeah, Kotlin is Java for the cool kids. <laughs> I think. So, you might want to consider that displays are optional. So, this device over here is my bus stop display. So that's an Android Things device which is running on a, uh, one of the developed kits. I've got a my own board that I put on top of it that turns the strings of text into the dot matrix matching signal that's required for this display. So not really a proper display, can't really um, do much with it, but it's, it's simple and it's all, all that I need for that, for that purpose. So displays are optional, so you can have a headless Android Things device. And you can also consider alternate UIs, so you can integrate with the Google Assistant SDK, you could use voice to control your device, or you can use uh, game controllers, keypads, or anything like that. So this is what a typical uh, Android stack looks like for a device. You've got your uh, applications along the top. So these are the ones that you typically are used to seeing. You've got your launcher, which provides you your home screen and icons that you can press to launch APKs and launch apps. You've got the phone, messaging, contacts, calendar, browser and settings. There's things that you typically interact with on a, on, a, on a mobile device. Under that you've got the application framework. Now these are all of the system services that actually run the Android operating system. Below that you've got libraries that, that provide you services like um, communications, OpenGL, Libc, uh, database layer. And then you've got the Linux kernel at the bottom, which is a modified Linux kernel which runs the um, patches required to so I run an Android things, or oh, sorry, I run an Android um, operating system. <coughs> so this is what they've done to make it uh, useful for Android things. So they've taken out the top layer. So your APK is the only app that's on the device. So when the app boots, it starts your app. So there's no launchers, no phone, no messaging, no contacts. There's also some things missing from the framework. So basically things that require a user to log in. So the concept is that a phone belongs to a person. The person has a Google account. They authorize that phone to do things. With Android things, it's a little bit different. It might be part of a household. So generally, it doesn't have a user account on it. It has uh, your application can provide some sort of uh, authentication system. But anything that requires a uh, User accounts not really necessary, so it's been removed. Does a pointer card wallpaper my uh, bus reminder? No, sorry. <coughs> Maybe for um, the next iteration. <laughs> Graphical displays, the next one that's, that's coming along. But they've added some things. So they've added peripheral AO. So peripheral AO means that you can talk to sensors, you can talk to inputs and outputs. Um, they've added the device management, so you can restart the device, turn it off. Uh, they've added this concept of user drivers and so that you can feed information from your sensors into the Android framework so you can get it out um, the way that you're used to. And they've added, added some connectivity. So you've got your Wi-Fi, Bluetooth connectivity. They've also um, added a client, client library for low pan, so you can use low pan radio to set up a mesh network in your, in your installation. So the peripheral I.O. consists of GPIO, so that's general purpose inputs and outputs. So you can set a line high, set it low, you can also read a line and set it high or low. You've got uh, pulse width modulation, so you can control LEDs, you can control the brightness of LEDs, you can also control servos or motors. Um, I squared C, so you can talk to peripheral devices like temperature sensors, humidity sensors, um, SPI, same idea and UIs. So you can talk to anything that you would normally talk to from an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi project um, using those standard interfaces. 
So here's an example using our favourite language of Kotlin. So we are opening a GPIO port. Uh, the pin name that we've defined, uh, we've said that it's an input. And we've said that we want to set a trigger on a 40, uh, 40 inch, so it goes from high to low. And then we can bang in some code that we want to be called. So Lando, thanks, you also have this concept of user driver. So you can read information from sensors directly, so a temperature sensor or a humidity sensor, or even a, a GPS, um, GPS receiver, uh, which is great, so you can consume that in your app, or you can also feed that into the Android uh, operating system. So you can create something from your sensor that creates an input that can be used by your application. You can create uh, if you had a GPS receiver, you could feed it into the location stack so you can use it using the Android location system. And then you can also access sensors. So you can feed your sensor information into Android so that Android knows about um, the sensors you've got. So here's an example of an input driver event. So we're basically generating a keypad, uh, a keypad input. So we're saying that when this GPIO callback is called, it's going to imitate the space. So your application running on the device just has to say, I'm interested in key press events and I'm interested in the space event and it will receive it automatically. And then there's the possibility to add other drivers. So there's a, already, Google's worked on a lot of drivers already, so there's drivers for temperature sensors, humidity sensors, servos, motors, some people write drivers for things like alphanumeric displays, LCD displays and they're all published on GitHub and you can handle it and you can use them in your apps. So this is an example. Uh, we're using the button input driver, which is a driver available um, from, on JCenter. Um, but it's codes on, on Bitbucket if you want to handle it. Uh, and it's basically giving us this key code space at our application level. All right, so summary of this part is that with Android things, you can use Google services to build hardware device. Um, you can use the power of Android. Uh, the board support package is managed by Google, so you don't have to spend your resources um, to get your board up and running. Roughly speaking, how much are like developer boards? So Raspberry Pi, <coughs> Raspberry Pi 3B, is the cost of a So no one. additional hardware just no additional hardware is required for that. Uh, the development kits. So the IMX7 developer kit with the display and a camera um, and a little peripheral board that's got a few sensors on it is $199 US. Uh, so those are the developer kits that you can use. Um, they're free, readily available. And if you're fabricating a product, how cheap will it get? So if you are, you can use those kits for development. Um, if you switch to production, you need to use one of the production certified um, kits. So the developer kits aren't certified for production, they don't have the secure boot um, and other features. So a intrinsic development kit for a production device is 595 US. And that's pretty much standard price for a production ready development kit for an advanced system. Um, if you were going to make the song yourself, you make the device yourself, then the song is like fifty to seventy dollars US, and then the board is whatever you could make a baseball for. So uh, that's Android things. There's a site you can go to um, build with Android things. There's a couple of resources that I recommend you go have a look at if you're interested. One is uh, the code labs, so there's a weather station code lab, so this will run you through setting up a weather station on a Raspberry Pi. Um, there's also a TensorFlow code lab, which is pretty cool, which is probably not a lot in the home automation space at the moment, but how about if your doorbell knew who was at your door because they recognised them using the camera? What if your cat door recognised your cat and said, well, you can come in because you're my cat, you're not the neighbour's cat. And it also recognised your cat when the cat's got a bird in its mouth. It says, no, sorry, you're going to have to eat that outside. 
Long Jethro. I know, I've said I'll pay a lot of money for a cap that does that. Well, here you go. Yeah. So using uh, TensorFlow, you can set up an edge classification um, project. You can use machine learning to determine whether it's your cap or it's another cap, whether it's carrying a bird, you can tell what bird it is, you can tip off Gareth Morgan that your cap is <laughs> destroying the main I'll give it to officially um, brand the product of a Gareth Morgan cap flap. Yeah, that would be the idea. So that's, that's an interesting area of the uh, image classification and machine learning. Um, so this client library is available for that. So basically out of the box, you can do image classification. And there's lots of projects on Hackster. People are already starting to use this. There's products on the market and there's a lot of hobby products, a lot of hobby projects. There's things like MQTT libraries. Um, there's, there's open threads so you can do mesh networks. So that's about it for Android things. Uh, any questions? So in regards to integration or or protocol protocols for Android and iOS, does it support things like HomeKit or Android equivalents or mm -hmm. so there's, a, there's a Google Assistant SDK, so you okay. can actually put the Google Assistant on your device so you can recognise voice commands. Yep. And then you can feed that into actions on Google. Okay. I don't know about HomeKit, sorry. Google Home. Yeah. Which is how they do Chromecasts. Mm -hmm. So you can you can you can make it a device that's integrated with Google Home, right. just using the actions on Google. So using the smart home backend. Yeah. Yep. Uh, how about like, Google Fit? Sorry. Google Fit. Google Fit. Sorry, I don't know anything about Google Fit integration. Oh my God, I'm rushing here. I noticed that you needed to explicitly say using the permission for general purpose I/O in the manifest. Yes. Is that? Really required when you're the only APK on the device. Yes. So the permission model is slightly different for Android things. So you've got runtime, the idea of runtime permissions on your device, on your regular handset. So your app can say, I need these permissions to run, and they'll be granted mostly at install time, but they'll also prompt the user at runtime. So you've got this idea of runtime permissions. With uh, Android things, there's install permissions and there's no runtime permissions. So all your permissions get granted at install time, but they still need to be granted for the system to give your app application access to it. Would it be something like making sure your app is compatible with the device and you can actually grant, like it might not actually have GPIO for some weird reason? Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, so if, if you, say if you wanted to use GPIO and you didn't, you didn't request that permission and the app, it just wouldn't access to GPIO. But the, um, so they're all, all of the permissions are granted at uh, install time because it's your app, so it's basically a trusted app. Right, okay. So that's one of, one of the reasons why probably they went away from the runtime permission model is that, you know, there's no concept of the user to, mm -hmm. to sit there and say, You pop up on your panel, you've got to sign says, do you want, do you allow access to the internet from this sign that accesses the internet? Oh. Um, so I have an IMX 7D and it seems you need to have like a lot of peripherals to build anything like remotely useful. How do you get started with that sort of thing? Or what's something cool you could build with just the IMX 7D development kit? I could ask that for Dave, it's a uh, cat bird recognition system. <laughs> <laughs> so great, you just need the, the camera, the cat, yeah. you need a little servo thing, and you can, you can go. Otherwise, uh, if you come see me after this, I can tell you how to Connect an LED to it, you can flash an LED. Um, there's all sorts of weird and wonderful things you can do with hardware if, if you're interested. <coughs> you should get together and talk about it. Otherwise, you just plug stuff in, and if smoke doesn't come out, it must be a golden. <laughs> so, did you get a developer cap? Uh, I I yeah. Did that come with the, the Pi hat? Uh, yeah, it came with the hat. Also has a temperature sensor, but the CPU is right underneath it, yeah. so I couldn't even use it. To, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's just kind of an off Yeah, yeah. Because I'm like, yeah. why is it 32 degrees? It's not 32 degrees in here. <laughs> Can you move the sensor? Yeah, you could probably do uh, so. I'll put it somewhere else. Um, I, I, like, I use a, a DS18 B20. Um, uh, it's a temperature sensor on, on, on a project, so I could put that anywhere. But I had to make a little converter because the uh, Android things doesn't support the one wire protocol. So I just had a, a device that converted one wire to I squared C. Um, 
probably the smart thing to do would be to buy an ice wet seat temperature sensor, but I didn't have any of those in my drawer, so I just had to sit and device. So um, with Android things, so this is just like the start of the, the, the Android things life cycle. It's been around for two years, been in production a few months. Um, I'm guessing that there's going to be more applications for home automation in the future, and it's just people are working on it right now. So it'd be great to, if anyone's got any ideas that they want to bring to life or any other projects that we want to work on, then uh, you know. We might need some soldering time. Do we need some soldering time in the uh, I've wondered about that. I'm not sure what the file system here is like. So uh, <laughs> we can find out. We'll just open the window. Yeah, we can find out. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if, if it's interest in doing a more deep dive in Android things, like hardware, software, let me know. Because I'll need to sort of judge numbers to figure out if it's worthwhile doing from like a whole people's interest and also not waste a day's time. But if you're keen on that stuff, so drop me a message or let me know after the session and yeah, keen to do something like that. Cool. Thanks so much. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dave. Yeah.